Summer vacation just got a whole lot longer in Kansas as the governor halts the reopening of schools. It just seems like a huge gamble to take with our kids. From crime and punishment. I look at him as a mass murderer. To politics and the latest monumental changes in Kansas City. What is the fear? What is the cause? that we keep this statue up. You know what, you're being rude. All straight ahead on Week in Review. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marley Scorley, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes, and thank you for joining us on this journey through the news of our week. The pace of change, as you know, has been remarkable. Can you keep track? Checking in with us this week to connect the dots on the major news developments where we live from 41 Action News investigative reporter Kat Reed, the managing editor of The Call newspaper, Eric Wesson, from KCUR News, Steve Kraske, and from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. Now, you can put an agenda together for this entire program and literally Within an hour, almost everything changes. Case in point are those plans for reopening your child's and your grandchild's school in a stunning development, the governor of Kansas halting that reopening until after Labor Day. Not in good conscience open schools when Kansas has numerous hotspots where cases are at an all-time high and continuing to rapidly rise. Stopping schools from reopening until at least September 9th. Steve Kraske, is that going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back for the Republicans who are controlling the legislature in Kansas? Will there be a push to further constrain the governor's powers? And what about a potential legal battle that would force the courts to weigh in on this? Oh, I think it could be, Nick, but I also wonder about how quickly the situation is evolving right now. Here we are looking at uh, the governor's order for starting schools after Labor Day. But if this fire continues to rage the way the numbers suggest that it might, I wonder how quickly this whole idea of a, a Labor Day start is going to fade pretty quickly. And the bigger question will become, are schools going to open at all in Kansas or in Missouri or anywhere going forward? So this could be just one delay, Kat Reed? You know, they are going to look at the infection rates and said that they might even have to consider pushing back further. You know, I'd love to look at different social media messaging. And I saw this from one Twitter user who goes by the name of Gretchen, Dave. She says, so I can go to Nordstrom, but I can't go to school. Also, you've had five months to get these things, those things being the masks, the thermometers, the hand sanitizer uh, that the governor says the schools need to reopen. Is Gretchen right? Haven't they had since March? to get all of those supp supplies? Why wait so long? Yeah, and she's exactly right, Nick, which suggests that delaying the opening of schools until September 9th uh, it, it will be very problematic as we get closer uh, to that date because it's hard to see what the school districts can or will do in the next six weeks that they haven't been able to do since April. When the social media posts that you just talked about suggested that she can go to Nordstrom but can't go to school. Nordstrom is a very different thing from school yards and school houses and classrooms. I mean, the kids are very close together for an extended period of time. There are no easy answers in any of this. But a lot of the concern has been uh, with teachers, age and underlying health conditions mean teachers are at higher risk and there are worries that there may not be enough staff members even willing uh, to return to the classroom. This week, teachers protested outside of the Lawrence School District. There are good things with going back, but it just, the health risks just outweigh everything. You know, there's no level of acceptable risk. It just seems like a huge gamble to take with our kids. There were about 50 uh, teachers there. How representative are they, though, of the thousands of teachers that we have uh, in Kansas and Missouri. And it's a, it's a great concern because I want to go back to the beginning of this uh, pandemic when uh, Raytown Schools District, for example, the cafeteria workers uh, contracted, uh, some of them tested positive. So they had to have their meals come in from Kansas City Public Schools. Then there was another incident with Kansas City Public Schools. So I don't think it's so much 
the kids as it is the adults. The kids will be wearing the mask, and it's going to be hard to keep uh, first and second and kindergartners in a mask all day. Well, we got the first test of that this week because actually in the North Kansas City School District, two schools headed back to class Monday, Crestview and Wynwood Elementary Schools. They're operating on a year-round schedule, and this was their first week back since the uh, pandemic began. Now, what was the verdict? I saw the reports cat of the kids going into the school. I never saw any negative headlines about it all going terribly wrong, though. You know, we ha I haven't heard much feedback about how exactly that went. We did hear a lot about the plans, the, the precautions. And I think the other thing is, is like this is a fairly small popula population of students who just went back. So it's not the same as having entire districts return to school. And I think that's when we would get more feedback. Now, talk of reopening schools comes at a time when the word mask has become a four-letter word for some in our metro. A young employee at a barbecue restaurant in Mission, Kansas, says he was threatened with a gun after he was asked by a customer to wear a mask. In Oak Grove, a liquor store customer is berated after tipping off public health officials that no one in the store was wearing masks, staff included. And even Governor Mike Parson feeling the heat, and not just from the hot grill he was placing steaks on at a large cattle association event in Missouri this week. Parson is called out for not wearing a mask or gloves while he was preparing food. News stories led with a line that claimed the governor was sending mixed messaging what was inconsistent about it? He has never demanded people wear masks in the first place, has he, Steve? No, but I think uh, the critics have a point here, Nick. I mean, he says he tries to stay six feet away from everybody, but he also acknowledges that he can't do it. He, his office sends uh, thousands of masks to different places around the state, and yet the governor isn't seen wearing masks. And you know, this is a, a tricky deal for a governor. It's tricky the same way it is for President Trump. More and more citizens expecting their leaders to be wearing masks at a time like this. We've seen the president obviously wear one just in recent days. Uh, governor Parson uh, is inviting critics in here a little bit. Kat. Yeah, and one of the things that he had mentioned when questioned about not wearing a mask during that event, um, some people, you know, were asking about that, and he said, well, you know, if I get anything on me or think I'm at, at risk, my people around me, we work uh, quickly to clean it up, but that doesn't take into consideration the no. issue of the fact that these droplets can remain in the air and you're in an indoor space close to a lot of other people. So I, that, you know, explanation really doesn't take into account one of the big ways that this virus can spread. Let me, right, let me bring correct. in Eric Wesson. Eric Wesson, though, the governor of Missouri, yes, he's getting those headlines about not wearing a mask, but is he getting praised this week for something else, which is he has said, yes, I am green lighting a special session on what is now viewed as one of our highest community problems, and that is violent crime. Yes, and uh, I think you got to give kudos to Mayor Quentin Lucas for bringing the conversation forward to force this special session. I don't know, and I'm going to be optimistic that it will be effective, but he is uh, talking about violent crime. What he's going to do about it, I don't know, but it uh, it's a good uh, visual. Well, uh, you know, it's interesting. If you thought this was going to be a freewheeling debate, though, over everything to do with crime, it's interesting he has six very extremely narrow areas that can be touched upon, um, Kat. I see eliminating residency requirements for St. Louis police officers, making it easier to try juveniles for adult crimes, loosening the rules for witness testimony in trials, finding cash for a witness protection program, and increasing the penalties for a person who gives uh, firearms to a child. Some people may look at that and say, with uh, this huge homicide rate we have, now topping over 100 in Kansas City, what difference would those changes make? Mayor Lucas is certainly wondering that. The only thing looking at that list of six that he seemed pretty excited or optimistic about is that witness protection fund, which would hopefully then encourage more cooperation in some of these investigations and, and get people to come forward. But the other ones, he said, you know, are not really going to move the needle. They don't address the root causes of the violence and crime. Um, another thing he was disappointed to not see included is a discussion about more mental health funding, which was something that the governor had previously talked to him about and seem to agree with him on. So I think there was disappointment in the narrow nature of those topics. Dave. Uh, the week has not gone well for Governor Parson. Let's just be honest about it. I mean, he's had this controversy, the mask controversy. He was savaged on cable television uh, by Eric Greitens, of all people, for his reaction uh, to uh, problems in St. Louis with the Black Lives Matter movement and the couple that pulled a gun in their home. And his poll numbers have dropped 
uh, uh, relative to Nicole Galloway, his likely opponent. So I think that's behind the special session to a degree. Remember last year, we all said, hey, let's talk about violent crime in a special session. And he said there wasn't enough time. There wouldn't be uh, the kind of focus on it that you need to have. And so I think some politics are involved in this as well. Steve. It's a special session in name only. We're not hearing one very important word in this session. That's the word guns. Nowhere is that to be found in this special session. Governor Parson won't go there, particularly during an election year. Uh, just watching Mayor Lucas sort of sidestep around that idea at his news conference was breathtaking to me. There's one thing and one thing alone that's valuable to the mayor in this whole special session. That's that witness protection program that's been mentioned here. Nothing else comes close to really getting into the idea of cutting violent crime. That's a huge missed opportunity right now as the state's two biggest cities continue to be torn apart by gun violence. Next up, a segment we're going to be calling crime and punishment. We can also add the word justice to that mix. Some stories come up in the news and you sometimes don't quite know what to think. We start with one of the most notorious names in Kansas City in modern memory, Robert Courtney. I think that this is the most horrible crime that I've ever been aware of. I look at him as a mass murderer. A Kansas City pharmacist who admitted to diluting thousands of cancer drug prescriptions is getting out of prison early because of concerns over COVID-19. Robert Courtney was sentenced to 30 years in prison back in 2002 after pocketing millions from his drug dilution scheme. More than 4,000 chemotherapy patients experienced less medication than their doctor prescribed. Some people received just 1% of the dose. It's uncertain how many Kansas Cityans died as a result of Courtney's greed, but surviving family members are certainly outraged he's getting out due to the pandemic. But Kat Reed, Courtney is now over uh, 60 years old. He's suffered a stroke, we're told, several heart attacks, has had cancer in prison. Isn't he exactly the kind of inmate that it makes sense to release when we do have this thing called COVID-19? Well, I think the biggest argument that, that people have, though, is why not release lower level offenders? Why are you releasing someone who was, you know, responsible for the death of so many people? And, you know, listening to the family members of these victims, it, it's so heartbreaking to hear these stories. And one thing that one of them said was really, you know, here's Robert Courtney. He took advantage of my family member's health crisis, and he's t taking advantage of COVID-19 now to get out of prison. Um, that's their argument. But I I think the issue is, you know, if you have lower level offenders who didn't necessarily do something that led to the death of another person, why haven't they been released? But what wasn't the criteria set out by the U.S. Attorney General's office to identify inmates who are coming to the end of their sentences and were not considered a continued risk to the public? He is now c coming close to 70 years old, uh, Dave Helling. Uh, was he a risk to the public? He'll remain on home detention for the remainder of his sentence. So. Uh, you know, he'll be monitored and, and, and but, but uh, uh, the Bureau of Prisons has an enormous problem on, on its hands, Nick, because no one really understands the criteria that was used in this case and in other cases, very non-transparent. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Kansas City was writing a motion to keep Robert Courtney in prison until 2027 at the very time the Bureau of Prisons was deciding to let him go. They weren't talking to each other. So I think it's a, you know, the Courtney uh, problem is worth the uh, discussion. But the, the broader question is why are they letting some people go and not letting other people go and uh, other people go? And no one really knows the answer to that. Well, last week we were laying to rest a four year old Kansas City boy who was shot in the head while he slept. This week, Kansas City mourns a three year old girl. Olivia Jansen from Kansas City, Kansas. Her father and his girlfriend have been charged with her murder. They dumped, allegedly, Olivia's body near a walking trail. Some questions now about whether it was the state that failed this child. The grandparents had suspected abuse was happening. Some news stories claim the police were called multiple times and child protection services were called, yet nothing happened. Is that really true, Kat Reed? 
Well, I, we can confirm that police were called many times to that house. Um, we've confirmed that she had been living there since the start of 2020, and police had been there several times. So uh, we do know that. We don't know what action was taken, if any, though, by DCF. And right now, the agency says that if there is a file on Olivia, that they would be releasing a summary of that um, in the coming weeks. And I'll also point out that my colleague, Jessica McMaster, has done a lot of work on this topic uh, related to the death of Adrian Jones, a little boy who was tortured, killed. His body was fed to pigs by his parents. There's a law named in his honor. It's a bill currently um, that for three years hasn't passed, and it would require caseworkers to actually lay eyes on a child who they believe is being abused rather than knocking and leaving. And so it'll be interesting to see if that bill could have made a, a change or would have impacted this case. The Division of Child and Family Services in Kansas has been a part of a, a lot of controversy, and Governor Kelly has had to answer a lot of questions about that since she's been governor but in foster care and other areas. Um, but we have this view, Dave Helling, that there is an army of folks who are investigating these complaints. As we found even in Missouri, there aren't a huge number of people in these services who are actually going out and knocking on doors anymore. I don't think anybody doubts, Nick, that there are more cases like this than there are people to handle them in both Kansas and Missouri. And that's, of course, a great tragedy. Um, and it's very clear in this case that other people knew that this young girl was being mistreated in the home. Uh, and, and, and the you know, further reporting will reveal the extent to which authorities knew about it as opposed to neighbors or friends or relatives, that type of thing. Um, but our safety net for kids like this is very porous. What should the punishment be for voting in a local city council race when you live in a different district? Is it a threatening letter from election authorities pointing out the seriousness of your mistake? Or should you be slapped with three felony charges with a punishment of up to 17 months in prison? That's what local Kansas Congressman Steve Watkins is now facing. He represents Topeka and Lawrence and pretty much all of our broadcast area on the Kansas side outside of Johnson and Wyandotte counties. He says this is a political hit job on him. Does the severity of the charges, though, seem out of step with the alleged infraction, Eric? No. <laughs> it's a violation. Did he do it or didn't he do it? If he did it, he should be held accountable for it. No, it's not a, a political witch hunt. He violated the law. But when Chris Kobach, as Secretary of State, was launching into a crusade against people who might have been double voting or they might have lived in western Kansas and might have voted in a municipal election in, on the Colorado side, uh, the Kansas City Star and its editorial board went after him as, you know, making too much of a big deal about this. What's the difference in this case, Dave Helling? Well, first of all, Steve Watkins is a member of Congress. That's the difference between, between his case and others. Um, but having said that, if this were an isolated incident, you know, he's claimed it was inadvertent, he made a mistake, used a mailing address. Uh, if his record were otherwise pristine, there's no question that politics were involved in yes. these charges and to some degree. Uh, but, but Steve Watkins has lots of problems. This is just uh, another addition to the list. This was from a previous election. Why now, when just before a major primary election, do these charges get brought against him? Does that give ammunition to his claim that this is political, a political hit on him, Kat? Well, I think the timing does, you know, give him ammunition to say that. Um, they claim that this was delayed because of COVID-19 and that that's why the charges were brought now, but it is very, very close to the primary. Um, you know, one other thing I, I wanted to add to this conversation is when you're a member of Congress, though, people expect you to know the rules and play by the rules. And so I think that that maybe there's a lack of sympathy um, if it's proven that he just didn't follow the law here. Does this force him out of his seat in Congress, Steve, or is this not, not serious enough for that? No, it wouldn't force him out. Assuming he wins re-election, Nick, here, and he is convicted of these crimes, here's news for you, breaking news. Convicted felons can serve in Congress. It would take an act of the House itself to censure him or boot him out, but a felon can serve. 
Will Kansas City decide to remove any more statues or monuments? And who's making those decisions anyway? This week, the Kansas City Council taking up a plan to create a 12-member commission to research and make recommendations on the removal of monuments. According to the proposal from City Councilwoman Melissa Robinson, the panel must have one member from each of the six city council districts, an historian, three members representing local civil rights groups, a religious scholar, and a representative of an indigenous group. How is the plan being received, Eric Wesson? It's, uh, it's being received fairly well. I think some of the issue is uh, who those 12 people from each councilmatic district would be. Uh, that's more of a concern than anything else, but it's, it's gaining some traction, and especially given the issue with Jackson County this past week, uh, kicking the can down the road, I think it's going to get more traction as well. Well, why not, though, just allow voters uh, to decide? That is, as uh, Eric mentions, the direction Jackson County chose this week, two weeks after county leader Frank White proposed removing two statues of former President uh, Andrew Jackson from the county courthouses in downtown and in De Independence County. County legislators vote to place the issue on the November ballot. Is letting the public make the decision the fairest way of tackling the issue, Steve? Well, you could argue that it is. You know, you put it to a vote of the public, Nick. What if it comes back fairly even, Stephen? It's a 53-47 kind of vote. What kind of mandate is that? you got to make the call anyway. So, you know, tough call. I get it. Let's talk about tough calls. Uh, we talked about it last week, but... Who could have predicted it would have happened so fast? I'm talking about the Washington Redskins retiring their name and their logo following pressure from sponsors. The Cleveland Indians also signaling support for a name change. Number of national stories now saying the dominoes will fall far wider and the Kansas City Chiefs may be pushed to make changes with pressure building. Are the Chiefs, though, still silent on this issue or are changes now afoot that we don't even know about at this point, Dave? Well, changes are afoot. Now, whether the Chiefs will change their name is a very difficult question, and it does not appear likely at this point, Nick. But uh, the Chiefs are well aware of the pressure they're going to feel from the rest of the country and locally to take a very close look at some of the game day traditions, the chop, for example, the name of the stadium, Arrowhead, war paint, the drum, all of those iconography uh, parts of the, day, uh, the game day experience will be uh, under scrutiny. And my guess is the Chiefs at some point in the near future will announce some important changes in that regard because they have to do something. Uh, and if it's symbolic, it still needs to be approached. And so we'll hear okay. something in the next I think it's years. interesting that Mayor Quinton Lucas, who appraised the Washington Redskins ownership group this week, can't read, saying they made a wise decision in their name change. I've heard nothing about this on his Twitter feed, yet he talks about every manner of sports event and sports uh, change. Why is he silent on this? Why isn't he weighing in? You know, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Maybe my other panelists do, but I, I haven't seen anything from him on that. Because politically, Nick, it's difficult for any elected leader to stand up and call for the changing of an NFL team's name. That comes fraught with all manner of blowback and maybe not as much upside potential as you would like. But having said that, it is a time for leadership. It's hard to believe to me that in five or 10 years, the name of this football team is still going to be the Kansas City Chiefs, given what's going on around the country right now. I think Patrick Mahomes could play a role here. He's already stepped up on Black Lives Matter. His reputation in the community is sterling. And if he were to step up and say, hey, I, I think the chop is inappropriate, I think that would go an okay. enormous way. Did you point. see that happening, uh, Eric? I could see that happening. I, I could see him stepping up and being a leader on the team and bringing this social issue up. When you put a program like this together every week, you can't get to every major headline making news in Kansas City. What was the big story we missed? Major progress underway on a new look KCI. Now new controversy and protests as the biggest contract to date is awarded to an out of town firm. Send these jobs to people who aren't from this city is unacceptable. Missouri Senator Josh Hawley back in the national spotlight fighting the NBA over social justice messaging on players' jerseys after an ESPN reporter tells Hawley, F you, the writer, is suspended. One of our Metro's largest fundraising events, the latest victim of the pandemic, already postponed once. Jazu officially canceled until next year. The Kansas State Fair canceled for the first time in its history. The Spanish flu didn't stop the showcase of all things Kansas. Neither did two world wars. 
Don't head to your local Apple store this weekend. Both locations in Leewood and on the plaza closed. The company says they'll reopen when it's safe to do so. The iconic American Girl store at Oak Park Mall closed permanently. Worlds of Fun scales back to four days a week as the pandemic continues to challenge entertainment venues. Some good news, Missouri reporting opioid deaths down in the state for the first time in five years. And look who made the cover of GQ and with an impressive tagline, the new leader of the NFL. Okay, Kat Reed, did you pick one of those stories or something completely different? I'm going to choose something completely different, which is the soon-to-be expiration of the additional $600 in unemployment benefits on the federal level. Talked to a lot of concerned, panicked workers. This really, um, the ball now is in Senate Republicans' court, and they haven't announced yet what they want to do, but it's likely that those are not going to be extended. So we'll be keeping an eye on the Senate for that. Eric Wesson. I'm going to take mine and do a tip my cap to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, Bob Kendrick. Phenomenal job in keeping that legacy alive. This is my hat autographed by Negro Leagues baseball players that were alive over the past 17 years that I've been at the call. So I'm tipping my hat to them. Excellent. Dave Helling. I can't follow that because I don't have a cap, but I would tip it if I did. <laughs> no, I am going to pick something from the list. I do think that uh, the discussion of MBE and WBE at the airport project is really reaching a boiling point. We haven't paid too much attention to it, but in the weeks ahead, there's really going to be a discussion as to whether Edgemore is doing all it can to make sure that minorities and women are full participants in that project. Steve Kraske. Nick, it's simple politics. You know, in three weeks, we have important elections on both sides of the state line. Never in my almost 35 years of living in Kansas City have I seen so little attention being paid to these very important decisions. The media is preoccupied with COVID as it right, rightfully should be. But boy, we got some big calls to make here, and folks have got to wake up to that reality. And on soon. that, we will declare that our week has been reviewed. Thanks to Kat Reed from 41 Action News for checking in with us, along with Eric Wesson from the call, Dave Helling of your Kansas City Star, and weekday mornings at 9 on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske. And I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Keep calm and carry on.